In the early 20th century, when two giants from distinctively separate disciplines collaborated on the development of an extracorporeal circulation device, I doubt they realized how extraordinarily unique their partnership was. At this moment, we are positioned in a fast-paced world where technology is advancing and globalization increasing, where distances get shorter, competition increases, and expectations are more demanding. A time when we need to make the best use of knowledge and look at each challenge from different points of view. A time for transdisciplinary integration of the sciences. A time when convergence innovation is needed most. Innovative leaders are curiously optimistic as they dare to take risks. And when leaders work together, the capacity to innovate increases exponentially. The world's most complex problems require convergence innovation. Through this approach, we have the ability to live longer, foster a better quality of life, and preserve this tiny rock we call Earth. It's why we are here, for the benefit of all. Hello, and welcome to the 2020 Pumps and Pipes Fall Webinar Series. I'm Bill Klein, your moderator, coming to you from the broadcast studios of the DeBakey Institute for Cardiovascular Education and Training, with the support of the Houston Independent School District in the Iron. Our theme today is earth science, so I need to begin with a scientific clarification. It turns out that we're beginning this fall series just a little bit early, as autumn does not officially arrive until 8.30 tomorrow morning. That's the moment when the sun's rays will be exactly parallel to the plane of the equator. So hopefully this hour will be an informative and enjoyable end to your summer. Before I introduce our topic and our guests, I want to say a few words to all of you students. I know that being a student right now is just about the toughest and most frustrating situation that anyone can be in. Electronic screens are not the best way to deliver the education we promised you. And for that, I am so very sorry. But if there is one message that is amplified by these unfortunate times, it's this. We need you. This series is about big challenges and big opportunities to make a difference. Some of those challenges and opportunities may fit your interests and skills, some may not. But the fact remains, if we are going to have a world that is healthy and sustainable and equitable and just, we need you. So what better topic to start with than our climate, which all of us have in common? Even as we speak, the eastern half of our country is being battered by hurricanes and the western half is being consumed by fire. These disasters are increasingly frequent and severe because of a settled scientific fact. We have too many carbon molecules in the air. Therefore, we need to stop putting so much carbon into the atmosphere and we need to take a whole bunch of it out. In order to do that, we need creative solutions, and we need you. So, how do you take a whole lot of carbon out of the atmosphere? Well, to start with, you need to think at the scale of nature itself. Here with us today are two big thinkers, Jim Blackburn, professor in practice of environmental law at the Baker Institute, Rice University, and Carrie Massiello, Professor of Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences, Chemistry and Biosciences, Rice University. We also have some big thinkers from Chavez High School, Ashley Cow and Michelle Harper, who will present their Tidal Watts idea for harnessing carbon-free energy from coastal tides. So let's begin. Jim Blackburn, tell us how nature may be our biggest ally in mitigating carbon. 
Well, thanks, Bill. I appreciate that very much. And I think we'll start off with Carrie. Uh, who teaches in earth sciences and who's going to start us off with the science. And then I'll come back and talk about the system that we've set up over at Baker Institute. Uh, so Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Can I have my first slide, please? So I'm Carrie Massiello. I'm an environmental scientist at Rice University here in Houston, and I study many aspects of how carbon moves through the Earth's system. Today, I'm gonna to talk specifically about the details of how carbon moves between the biosphere and the atmosphere. Next slide, please. This is the Keeling curve. This is the iconic curve of the last 60 years. This curve shows the concentration of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere measured at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. <laughs> there are a number of trends that you'll see in this figure, and we'll talk a little bit more about these later, but the dominant trend here is you can see that the atmosphere's CO2 concentration has been increasing since measurements began at Mauna Loa in the late 1950s. Next slide, please. But we don't have to rely on data only from the last 60 years. We actually have close to a million years of data on the atmosphere's CO2 concentration. We retrieve this data from the gas bubbles trapped in ice cores. And this is a record of the atmosphere's CO2 concentration for the last 800,000 years with the Mauna Loa data mapped on top of it. As you can see in these data, the Earth's system has fluctuated between CO2 concentrations of about 180 parts per million to about as high as 270 parts per million of CO2 over close to the last million years as recorded in glaciers. We are right now as of September 17th at 411 parts per million. We have not had atmospheric CO2 levels this high for more than 10 million years. Next slide, please. We know that CO2 in the atmosphere drives the planetary temperature. And we can look at the record of temperature on the globe and the record of CO2 and see them rising in sync since 1880. Next slide, please. We're also seeing now that higher CO2 means hotter weather. And the way that's occurred since 1970 in Houston has been that we've increased the number of days consecutive days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Those of us who live in Houston are well aware of this trend. Next slide. Next slide, please. So warmer air evaporates more water and that increases the amount of rainfall that we are experiencing. And so in the United States, we're seeing more days of rainfall that yield two inches of water compared to the average since 1950. Next slide. And these are, these, these are the same data for Houston. The days of heavy precipitation in Houston have almost doubled since 1950. The days with two inches or more of rainfall have almost doubled in Houston since 1950. Next slide. Now, again, as something that's very familiar to all of us who live in Houston, climate disasters get expensive fast. And you can see the number of billion dollar disasters in 2019 dollars. Uh, Texas is a big spot in the middle of that. These climate events cost us money, as anybody who has recently lived through Hurricane Harvey can tell you. Next slide, please. So how do we manage atmospheric CO2? So this is what's called the bathtub model, and it's one way to understand the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Our pre-industrial CO2 values were 280 parts per million. I told you earlier that as of a few days ago, we had 411 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. The atmosphere receives CO2 from natural sources and from fossil fuel combustion. Right now, we only have 
natural sinks that are removing CO2 from the atmosphere at a, at a rate uh, that they have for millions of years. What we really need are anthropogenic sinks. We need a human sink. We need to remove CO2 intentionally from our atmosphere. And we have a number of options for how to do this. Next slide, please. So to understand the problem of CO2 removal, we talk about something called the stabilization triangle. And the stabilization triangle builds a triangle between the business as usual scenario, which you can see here marked as BAU, and a scenario marked here as WRE 500, which holds the atmospheric CO2 at about 500 parts per million. To fill in that triangle, we need wedges. And so each one of these wedges, we understand to be a reduction of 1 billion tons of CO2 per year. And we need at least 15 wedges. These wedges can be either reductions in emissions of CO2, or they can be additional carbon sinks. And today's talks are going to give you examples of both of these options. Next slide, please. Stabilization wedges, for example, can be an increase in our use of wind power, an increase in our use of solar power. We could end deforestation and that would give us one wedge. And there'll be two new wedges that are not on this figure that you'll hear about today. Next slide, please. So I wanna get back to this Keeling curve. And now I'm a teacher, so I can't resist. I have to have a moment of education here. There are four major trends in this curve. And I'm gonna take a second, and for all of you who have a pencil and paper, write down what you see as some of these trends. So now I'll spill the beans. What are the trends that we see here? So there's one trend that everyone sees at first. And that's that these values are increasing. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is going up. But the next trend that you'll see is that the slope of the tangent line is also increasing. So if you were to draw a line, if you were to attempt to fit a line to this curve, it would not be a straight line. It would be curved. And that's because the rate at which we are adding CO2 to the atmosphere is increasing. And the third trend that you'll see here is that there's an annual cycle. So the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing and decreasing annually. And that rate of annual increase and decrease is much larger than the secular background, slow rate of increase that we see since 1950. And the other trend that's hard to see, you may, you may be able to see it if you squint by looking at the very beginning of the curve and the very end, the height from peak to trough in each of these annual waves is increasing. So the amount of carbon that's being drawn from the atmosphere by photosynthesis is increasing every year. But simultaneously, the amount of carbon released to the atmosphere from photosynthesis is also increasing, giving us a large, larger swings in amplitude. Next slide, please. And it's these swings that are key to understanding the potential for soils and the biosphere to manage the CO2 pool. Now, I think you're going to have to click a couple of times to get the animations through on this slide. Perfect. You can do one more click. Okay. So the units here are gigatons and a gigaton is 10 to the ninth tons. And these are the units of the carbon cycle. We have 830 gigatons of CO2 in the atmosphere right now. And every year, photosynthesis withdraws 120 gigatons, while plants and soil respire that same amount right back to the atmosphere, giving us a net zero from biology. Fossil fuel combustion in the most recent year recorded emitted 10 gigatons of CO2 to the atmosphere. Now, many people don't know that the soil carbon pool is many times larger than the atmospheric CO2 pool. The soil carbon pool is at least 240 gigatons of carbon. If we can increase photosynthesis or decrease respiration, we can store more carbon in soils and cause a carbon dioxide sink in the atmosphere. Next slide, please. So what if we could manage our land to reduce that return flux of CO2 to the 
So right now, the biosphere is virtually net zero. A tremendous amount of CO2 is drawn out of the atmosphere by photosynthesis, but a tremendous amount is returned. This process does not happen in the same way in every ecosystem. Some ecosystems and some soils are poorly managed and they are large sources of CO2 to the atmosphere. Other soils and ecosystems are well managed and are large CO2 sinks. What if we could expand our good land management practices? What if we could pay people to manage the land better and expand soil carbon sinks? Next slide, please. So when we increase the amount of carbon in soil, we call that a triple win. It's not just a win because it removes CO2 from the atmosphere. It also helps soils store water better. So soils that are rich in carbon hold more water and farmers don't need to irrigate and their crops become more resilient to drought. Their crops also use nutrients more efficiently, reducing the need for fertilizer. And in the end, you end up with less stressed plants that are more productive. And we call that a triple win. And so at this point, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Professor Blackburn, who will tell you the details about how we're going to make this happen. Okay, thank you, Carrie. And if I could have my first slide, please. Okay, while we're putting the slides up, uh, one question for Carrie. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the, uh, the, the WRE 500 goal, that is parts per million in the atmosphere if we put all these wedges in place, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so we're at 411 now. And so even, yes. even, with, even with this extraordinary effort, we're looking at a world where we continue to have Greek letter named hurricanes and fires uh, that, 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 that seems pretty compelling. And even, even with all these wedges, and, uh, and I, guess, I guess I'd say the students, this is a call to action. What, uh, what sort of time frame are, are we looking at in, in, in order to, uh, before we, we might get to 500? The time frame is now. Yeah. Yeah, that we need to act now. And uh, we need to develop these removal technologies because it's possible that we're going to overshoot 500. It's not going to be pretty if we overshoot 500. But if we do, we need to have some technologies ready now to remove CO2 from the atmosphere so that we can manage an overshoot. That's right. And that's you students. We need to be ready now. We need you. Jim, how can we do this? Well, I would like to show you if we're ready to go with the slideshow. Okay. Uh, if not, I can I can do it without slides, but um, I think it'd be better with slides. Um, I want to talk about what we've come up with at the Baker Institute, uh, where we are developing a soil carbon storage standard. Uh, Carrie's part of this, uh, and we have a, a lot of people that have joined us. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this work, though, started uh, because of hurricanes. Uh, this is uh, damage from Hurricane Ike. That's a picture of Hurricane Ike on the right. And we were trying to figure out how to set aside the land on the upper Texas coast that was lower than 20 feet in elevation because we discovered that while the Bolivar Peninsula up on the top left got horribly destroyed by Ike, the natural systems right nearby uh, did quite well and, and fared well. And I, by the way, I encourage you to watch the coverage about the uh, rising waters and certainly about the potential rainfall flooding. These big storms are getting worse because of what Carrie's talking about. And uh, we're seeing larger surge, we're seeing larger storms, and we're certainly seeing larger rainfall amounts. Uh, next slide, please. In order to come up with a solution, we knew that we couldn't use uh, government regulation in Texas. It just uh, didn't going to work with our legislature. But we know we can talk with landowners if we can talk about monetary solutions. So we wanted to find ways to basically pay the landowners for keeping their land and for expanding the carbon going into their land. Because as Gary said, we can put carbon dioxide, uh, we can take it out of the atmosphere and we can put it into the soil if we manage it well. Next slide, please. We looked at different ways of paying landowners and 
we came up with carbon dioxide payments being probably the most important uh, way that we could do this. And so that area in red was what we were really focused on trying to kind of get us started. And what we wanted to do was pay the landowners there for expanding the amount of carbon dioxide they were putting into the uh, in the soil. And uh, we uh, next slide, please. Uh, and we went and talked to buyers. And what we found was that the uh, business community is all over trying to do something about the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to the point that there's all of these different kind of positions that are being staked out by different companies. And uh, Carrie uh, referred to business as usual. Uh, in, one, in one of her slides is really the uh, top of that triangle we're trying to reduce. Well, almost no business that we're seeing is talking about staying business as usual, uh, kind of as they have been practicing, say, for the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, what we see is an array going from lower carbon emissions up through carbon neutral operations, which means that, that you take care of your own carbon footprint and uh, neutralize it. Uh, if you make your products uh, carbon neutral, then that means those of us that buy gasoline would have our carbon footprint from burning gasoline taken, uh, taken out of the atmosphere by the same companies that make the gasoline. Carbon negative is a stretch of uh, beyond that, where you actually take more carbon out of the atmosphere than you're putting into it. And then the kind of the, the, the big goal is to be totally regenerative and to have an economy that works very much like nature does in those circles and cycles that uh, Kerry pointed out. Uh, but the point is that this is happening right now and business is looking for options. And so if we can set up an effective uh, soil carbon storage system, uh, the businesses will be very happy to participate if we can make it credible. Next slide, please. In order to set up a system, uh, the Baker Institute has created a working group, and the Baker Institute is part of uh, Rice University uh, that was uh, named after James Baker, uh, who was an incredibly creative Secretary of State of the United States, lives here in Houston, big supporter of Rice University, and a very good policy thinker. And the Bakery Institute is very well respected in its thinking about particularly the energy industry. And so we're trying to set up a system there. And in fact, I think have established a system where we work with the landowner seller and that companies that kind of work with them assemble essentially a package to be certified by a certification entity. And out of that will come a certificate. And that certificate is called a carbon credit, and it can be bought and sold. And that carbon certificate says that if you buy this certificate, it represents one ton of carbon dioxide that has been stored in the soil. That would be sold to buyers who then pay money back to the landowner seller. So we, we have a lot of winners here. Uh, the energy industry gets options the landowner seller gets to make money that they didn't make in the past. And in the process, you see the metal arc in the middle, uh, in the process, we think we'll be restoring the ecology of many of the native prairies and wetlands of the United States, the forest, and that nature will be a winner as well. So we think there's a possibility of a triple win here if we can get this system set up. So to do that, the Baker Institute is developing a set of standards and I'm co-leading this effort along with uh, Ken Medlock and uh, Carrie as part of this effort. And next slide, please. And we have a working group. These are a few of the members of the working group. We have landowners. We have uh, oil companies. We have other corporations. We have Texas Parks and Wildlife and the New Mexico Department of Agriculture. Uh, we have a, about, at this point, we have about 50 different institutions that are working with us and over 100 individuals that are coming together to try to create this standard. And in talking about it, many people around the United States are referring to our effort as a grassroots effort to develop carbon standards as opposed to standards that are being developed by the government or by basically you know, groups that have been formed by either industry or by others. Uh, this is really truly a Texas-based grassroots uh, group uh, New Mexico has a lot of participation in this, and we have quite a lot from Oklahoma as well. So we're, we're gaining 
I think, traction throughout the United States with this standard, which I'll now describe to you. Next slide, please. Uh, we think that this standard can have a huge impact on the amount of carbon dioxide that can be stored in the soil. The area in yellow on this map of the United States is primarily grasslands and grazing lands. The area in brown is primarily um, farmland that used to be prairie. About 200 million acres of that farmland acreage is used to grow uh, grain for animals. And that is uh, really kind of one of the targets we have. But we think that grass-fed beef uh, is going to be the key to making a lot of this work. And we think there are all sorts of grazing techniques that will replicate the, the bison that used to be on the prairie and that we will restore grasslands and put a lot of carbon dioxide into the soil. Next slide, please. Now, the basic concept, we're using photosynthesis to capture carbon and store it. We're landowner friendly. We're very respectful of property rights. We want to work with landowners. Everything we're talking about is based on measurement. Measurement is a key. In order to be credible, we've got to have measurements to show that we have increased the amount of carbon in the soil over a period of time and that it stays there. And our other goal is that we really want to create a market system where we can buy and sell these credits. Next slide, please. Now, this is as simple as it gets. Basically, native systems put carbon dioxide into the soil. That is what our credits are being issued for. We take the excess carbon dioxide that's been emitted by industry, by cars, and we store it in the soil. Next slide, please. It's as simple as growing potatoes. Essentially, we're growing carbon in the soil. With potatoes, you want to harvest them and sell them. With regard to carbon, we want to store it and keep it in there, turn the soil into a vault, a chamber, that we keep adding to each year, but don't take out. And basically, we believe that if you put the carbon in the soil, if you store it as a landowner, then you have a right to be able to sell it. And the current systems that are out there in, in the world don't work in this way. And so we're trying to create a system that works for landowners, which is quite a departure from what is currently uh, kind of used throughout the United States. Next slide, please. Measurement, again, is the core of credibility. This is this is Carrie's backyard here. Um, <laughs> this is the type of thing that Carrie knows very much about. Uh, I am learning a tremendous amount about measurement. Uh, this is a expensive process to uh, uh, measure the carbon in the soil. It is a time consuming one. And there's going to be all sorts of technological advances in the future. Uh, because if, if what we're doing becomes as widespread as we think it will be, there will be a tremendous of demand for new technology. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so basically, our measurement framework is to have direct measurement. Uh, we measure um, at the beginning of a transaction, and then we come back every three to five years and measure the increases. And that is what can be sold in this market system. We're also looking for creative ways. Uh, we're working with satellite uh, imagery. We're working with people that are doing extensive research on remote sensing to try to figure out how we can increase the speed and efficiency and lower the cost of this carbon testing. Uh, but testing is at the center of everything that we're doing. Uh, next slide. So a landowner that wants to participate in our system really has to uh, make a couple of commitments. One, they have to not disturb the subsurface. We want the scene on the right. We want the native prairie with a deep root system to flourish. We do not want to come along with a disc and disc it up. We don't want to plow it up because that releases the carbon dioxide that's stored in the soil. So the landowner, and this is voluntary, the landowner does not have to participate. But if they do, they can't plow or, dis or disturb the sur subsurface for 10 years after they make a sale of storage. Each year they make a, a new transaction, it increase or adds 
10 years. And so it's what we call a rolling 10-year commitment. So in the second year, you commit to 10 years. That's uh, net uh, 10 plus uh, one year, 10 plus two years. And in that way, we will have an increase in the coverage of this over time as long as the landowners keep getting paid for storing the carbon dioxide. And these payments are on an annual basis. So we anticipate to see the 20 to 40 to 50 years of protection uh, to bridge into the era when you guys are gonna be much older and when hopefully we will have a totally um, uh, renewables type of system uh, in place, at least potentially. Next slide, please. This is a slide that indicates that rolling 10-year commitment where each new year you make a new 10-year commitment, essentially adding a year. And over time, we feel like we'll get decades of protection. Next slide, please. There also has to be someone to issue these credits. We are proposing to create a new certification entity that will be created and housed here in Houston most likely will be a nonprofit institution. It could be associated with Rice University. We're exploring that, but it may also be standalone. Uh, but the Im most important thing is it will be based on sound science. It has to be credible. We've talked to buyers and they said, look, we don't really care what the system is as long as it has three things, credibility, credibility, and credibility. And so that's really, uh, kind of, in a way, the most, one of the most important aspects that we're doing is creating this certification entity to go with these standards that have 10 principles that have been agreed to by the working group and that we're in the process now of uh, publishing uh, papers and putting out our concepts for our people all over the United States and the world to give us feedback in on. And so far, we've gotten quite a lot of positive feedback of there's general recognition that the current system that we have in the, in the world really isn't working to expand our, our soil storage of carbon dioxide. And we need options and we need to see these options implemented quickly. And this has the advantage that, frankly, the farmers and ranchers would love to get paid for storing carbon and they can, uh, they can also still run cows. They, this would be a great assistance in basically keeping the rural economy of the United States viable well into the future. Next slide. And so not only do you get carbon put in the ground with this uh, alternative, but we get water resilience. Uh, I initially started off this presentation talking about the fact that we wanted to find ways to keep these lands natural and to restore prairies and wetlands to hold floodwaters. It also should help us on water supply. It's gonna help economic resilience in uh, the farm and ranch community, in the oil and gas community. We'll get carbon resilience from it. And we think the ecology of the United States will be a big winner as well because grasslands have been uh, lost at an amazing rate over the last century. And we believe grassland restoration will be a centerpiece of this whole system. And so we think that what we have to offer is something that is going to be of value to the United States and is going to be essential in moving forward. And we're hopeful of having our first transactions in the early to middle part of next year, which may be ambitious, but we honestly think we can get that done. And last slide is that if you want to get hold of me, my last name is Blackburn, but I only put eight letters in my um, Rice uh, email address. So I am blackburr at rice.edu and contact me if you'd like to know more about that. And uh, thank you for listening to us today. And I hope you found this interesting. And thank you, Jim and Kerry. If you have a few minutes, uh, I've got a couple of questions that I hope represent what all the students out there have. Uh, this is compelling and exciting. Jim, the, uh, uh, what we're saying is we have a tremendous potential to use a resource we have here in Texas, a lot of land and a lot of grasses to store carbon under the ground. And under the ground is the key. We want those roots to be uh, delivering carbon and not disturb it with plowing. And we certainly don't want to pay it, pave it over. But it's not a case where we're just taking that land out of any economic value at all. 
we can be creative and use that land as well. Is that not correct? You mentioned running. Oh, cattle. that's absolutely. Um, what about? Uh, I can see a scientific future in 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 us all figuring out ways to use what that land produces. We want to put deep root grasses that deliver a lot of carbon, but uh, uh, what about all the all, all what those grasses produce? All the fabrics and the uh, the materials that we can use. I can see a lot of research to figure out how to use those grass products economically for a win-win situation. Um, I'm thinking of the uh, the hemp industry. Hemp was a uh, you know a material that we made a few ropes and things like that before, but now there are all sorts of uses. So I'm very excited about that. Yep. Is that? Go oh, ahead. that's a, that's absolutely true. But I think that. We're really focused on grazing and on cattle mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, the cattle industry, you know, I mean, that's kind of the primary use of a lot of our grasses right now is to feed cows. And uh, we'd rather feed cows with grass than uh, send them to, to feedlots because from a carbon uh, cycle standpoint, there's a lot less carbon emissions with uh, grassland cattle than with uh, feedlot cattle. And we think that the landowner can make extra money from uh, the, the carbon sales that they could enjoy. And right now, we're, I think the market will be somewhere about between $15 and $20 a ton. We think that could easily go up to $40 to $60 a ton uh, in the not too distant future. So we actually think the carbon storage itself will become a tremendously viable economic activity. And then we'll have uh, cattle grazing and Kerry can perhaps talk more about certain types of agriculture, farming, that where we're looking at certain regenerative uh, species of wheat and things like that, where we don't have to plow to um, to collect the um, or to, to replant for the next year, that we can reuse these plants year after year after year. So there's all sorts of innovation that's coming from this, and I think there's going to be frankly, many economies that will spin off of this type of thing. Um, one other question. What about on a micro scale? Uh, I have, what, a quarter of an acre of my house. I've got a yard. Um, I mow it. I trim it. I fertilize it. Is there anything I can do? And would it make a difference if I, uh, if I worked on making that deep root? You don't have to pay me. I want a green yard and I want to remove carbon. If all of us work together, even here in the city, would that make a difference? I'll let Gary take that one. Yeah, sure. You can go to Buchanan's nursery and buy deep-rooted grasses and you can redo your yard in deep-rooted grasses. And uh, I'd encourage you to stop fertilizing. Uh, fertilizing is not uh, not good for the watershed. That that adds nitrogen pollution to, to our watershed and will come back to haunt us later. But yeah, sure, you can plant deep-rooted grasses in your yard. That will make it, in, in fact, there's some species of grasses that don't need to be mowed. So you could plant deep-rooted grasses and quit mowing your yard. Okay. Um, the, the, the STEAM student in me, are there any little tests? If I took a stick and drove it down, is there any way that I can kind of measure how deep the roots are? Can I make an estimate of how much carbon I am storing? Well, I'm gonna, again, I will defer. I would just simply say that, you know, so much of the grass that we have, our carpet grass that we use for our yards has almost no root system. Uh, it is a very, very shallow rooted um, plant. And what we're really interested in is depth of the roots. So, I mean, even to, uh, to, to dig up, uh, if you have a natural piece of, even where what you would call weeds are growing up, to dig up just a piece out and look at the depth of the root system would be one experiment. And Carrie, I'm sure you do all sorts of these things. Well, I have a student right now building a, um, a do-it-yourself soil health kit. And she doesn't, she hasn't put it up on the, my research group website yet, but uh, uh, she's building a do-it-yourself soil health measurement toolkit that you can do with a coffee filter and a scale. And uh, I anticipate that'll be up on my website in about a week. Oh, that's excellent, excellent. One more question. You know, we all hear and uh, we're all being proactive about uh, trees and, and planting trees. Uh, are trees, uh, you talked about the, uh, the, the respiration cycle there. 
Uh, trees, of course, as they grow, store carbon, but they store it above the ground. What's the balance? If we have some land in Texas, for example, do we want to encourage trees or grasslands? Well, I would say we would want to encourage both. I think there's certain areas that are better suited for trees and others mm -hmm. that are better suited for grasslands. One of the problems with trees, I, I just heard about it in the forest fires out in Oregon, that one of the forests that burned, I think, in central Oregon, uh, was a carbon, uh, they, they had sold the carbon storage rights in those in those trees. Uh, the forest uh, carbon storage market is much more advanced than is the soil carbon storage market. And uh, that's one of the real fears about tree storage is that, that forests do catch fire and burn. Uh, our grasslands can burn and it would not hurt us. In fact, it may even be helpful. Uh, but uh, with forest, you worry about that. But we think there, that trees are also very important, and some of the work I'm doing with nonprofits is really emphasizing the trees. Carrie? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I have nothing to add to that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, what I'd like to do now to all you students is continue with the theme of We Need You. We want to encourage you, we want to involve you. And I've got a few slides here to show some of the ways that uh, we at the Pumps and Pipes are wanting to do that. Um, as I mentioned, these are perilous times. I mean, we are not meeting, we're in, a, we're in a COVID place, and we're doing a lot of electronic stuff. But I promise you, I promise you that will end. And when that ends, we want involvement and we want to do it now. We have a number of uh, exciting activities that we've done in the past in Pumps and Pipes, and we are continuing into the future. So I want to say to all you students and all you teachers out there, we want to hear from you. We need you, and we have a number of ways which we'd like to engage you. For example, uh, back in 2019, we've engaged a number of students here from uh, Methodist Hospital with a live surgery, with some of the preeminent surgeons in the world uh, t telling you what they do and what you might be able to do. Uh, uh, next slide. Um, we've also been live recently from uh, the aerospace community. Uh, we've got a lot of NASA people here in Houston that are anxious to work with you and to tell you what they're doing. Also, we've had uh, uh, senior scientists from the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab in California, Lawrence Livermore Lab, and all sorts of places that are in that. So if that's your interest. Next slide. One of the things that I am very interested in is working with you students on engineering principles. Uh, if you are interested in that, we have got a number of activities that we, some we did earlier this year and are a whole lot of fun. Uh, you might have heard about our CHEM-E, Chemical Engineering Car Challenge, also known as the Tour to Iodine. And I hope you can see the students there being really excited because that is an intense competition. What we do there is we build a chemical clock, we mount it on a car, and we send that car on its way. And by the action of that chemical clock, that determines the distance that, that it drives and the closest to the finish line wins. We had uh, four schools participate that back in, uh, in February, and what an excellent job they did, and I want to emphasize what fun they had. So if any of you are interested in that, especially any of you that are interested in building cars and running cars, maybe some of your robotics club out there, contact us. We are more than happy to do it, and I think we might be able to be able to do that virtually. We'll figure it all out. Uh, back in February, we also did something we called the Trebuchet Challenge. If I have a slide for that, there it is. Trebuchet, of course, is a, uh, a catapult. Uh, the ancient Romans used to use it in, uh, in, in their uh, military endeavors. Uh, we built those, some of those with uh, PVC pipe and uh, little plastic projectiles. And safety glasses, of course, because we launch these projectiles all over the laboratories. A lot of physics in there, the length of the arm, the length of the string, the, uh, the counterweight that goes, 
And we had these schools that figured all that out. In addition, gave some very compelling uh, uh, presentations of why their trebuchet should be acquired by the Roman army for their uh, latest adventure in Gaul and elsewhere. And so what I'm saying is um, um, uh, there is a lot out there that all of us that have had the, for the great fortune to have wonderful careers in STEAM and STEM related areas would like to share with you. The reason we do this, of course, as I said many times, we need you. And we want you to know what, how important all this is and in many ways how fun it is. One of the other things that we did uh, this summer was we called the Innovation Challenge. And we asked nine teams from five high schools to come up with their innovations, in particular innovations that would change the world. And here's a slide that shows some of them. Uh, uh, portable uh, compactors for biodegradable waste, uh, uh, universal mask eyeglasses support, emergency water filters, the, the creativity and the entrepreneurial spirit was amazing. We have here one of those teams, one of those teams from Chavez High School that will show you what they did. And I hope they are an example to you all and all of you will be encouraged to do that, uh, both in our future innovation challenge and becoming innovators that will change the world. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle and Ashley. Tell us about your Tidal Watts project, Harnessing Tidal, uh, tidal Energy. Okay, Michelle, are you starting? Yes. Okay, you've got the floor. Tell us about your project. So basically our project is about tidal energy because coastal regions can't really access it as like during hurricane seasons. So we created this idea so that during those seasons, they could still have the energy that they need. Okay, our slide, this slide is our problem. So though there is an immense potential in tidal energy, it is not being utilized widely in coastal regions. Current turbine systems are not designed for shallow coastal shores as they are very large and expensive. This means that we need a lot of depth to make them useful. Also, they are very expensive. Due to this, they are designed from scratch, including the mounting process. In order to solve these issues, we are suggesting using pre-existing seawalls and piers to mount mini turbines from. This will allow us to better utilize structures already in place, reducing costs. It also allows us to bring the turbines closer to the shores. So our concept, which we call Tidal Watts, we are basically suggesting to install mini turbines underwater that will be perpendicular to the flow of the tides. The turbines will be small enough to install along the legs of the piers. As you can see from the design, the turbines are not your traditional three-bladed, rather with a protector over it and it's four-bladed. These are cho chosen to ensure minimal damage to sea life. So this slide, we're really trying to establish the idea that it doesn't have to be one large turbine generating a lot of electricity. Since water is a thousand times denser than wind, even with slower rotation, these smaller turbines can create a lot of energy. So we want to create tidal watch, which optimizes this property of water, then install multiple of them along different piers. There are pre-existing turbines out there, such as the Atlantis AK-100, where the diameter of the turbine is 18 meters, which produces one megawatt of power. We understand smaller turbines will produce less power, but that is why we want many of them. We aim to scale it down to three meters diameter or even less. If we could have a power output of 100 kilowatts per turbine, then it would, we can increase the number of turbines to, equal, to create the equal amount, if not more energy. 
With the right mathematical tool, further research and collaboration with industry partners, this concept could become a reality very soon. Since they do not need a lot of depth, we can even fit these along different piers along a coastline, even at a place like Pleasure Pier. Though this is still at its concept stages, by making turbines smaller but more in, qu in quantity, we can help bring tidal energy power to the people of the coastal regions more easily and make it more accessible. That is Ashley Cow, our designer, and I am Michelle Harper, your researcher. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thank Ashley, you. anything to add? And if you would like to have further information about our idea, those are our emails, and you can contact us whenever you want. Ashley and Michelle, what a great idea. Are you going to be following this up? Are we going to have the uh, Ashley and Michelle Industries uh, yeah, several years from now? Maybe. It is very important, and I really hope you do. Remember, remember, we're touching on such important existential issues. Uh, we, the world needs energy. We cannot survive without energy. But we also have to be, make it sustainable energy. And things like uh, taking carbon out of the air, uh, carbon is always gonna be part of our, uh, of our energy equation. We need to be able to manage it. We need to be able to regulate our emissions and we need to take it out of, out of the air. We also need, also need alternate forms of energy as you two are, are proposing and others. And I can't see anything more exciting than that future unfolding with you in charge. Um, uh, Kara, you're teaching students that are just about, uh, 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 just a little older. Um, I hope you are excited too about the, uh, the increasing uh, innovation, in innovativeness and the, uh, the knowledge that these students now in high school are, are, are bringing to the world. And I hope that they are part of the staying under 500 solution. Any comments? It's to be seen through from design and vision all the way into implementation. Absolutely, absolutely. And for all of you students out there, as, as you can see from this presentation, it is not just engineers, it is not just biologists, not just scientists, but it's lawyers and physicians and people that work with the earth and people who work with the mechanical parts of it. We all need to, to, to work together. We need you. And I'm gonna promise you this, Ashley and Michelle and others, to the extent that you are doing these things and you are making a difference, you are going to have a wonderful career time. Um, I've had that, that experience and it is my firm desire to pass it on to you. So, so congratulations on your Title Watts project. There's a lot more to do. There's a lot more to do economically, legally, engineering wise, but you have a great start. And as you, go, as you do that, um, you're gonna have the time of your life. So thank you. This is uh, uh, a slide that uh, uh, we're looking forward to our 14th annual Pumps and Pipes meeting. Our first annual Pumps and Pipes was 2007 uh, in, in University of Houston, uh, where we gathered about 100 of our closest friends to talk about oil and water mixing. We've greatly expanded it. We're in our 14th year of annual meetings. This year, of course, it will be virtually. It will be on December 7th, 2020, and we will have a number of compelling guests and visitors from aerospace, medicine, engineering, oil and gas, land management, and all those topics that we're talking about. We're all working together. Uh, follow our website, and uh, we hope you can all register and be part of Pumps and Pipes 14 on December 7th. 
In the early 20th century, when two giants from distinctively separate disciplines collaborated on the development of an extracorporeal circulation device, I doubt they realized how extraordinarily unique their partnership was. At this moment, we are positioned in a fast-paced world where technology is advancing and globalization increasing, where distances get shorter, competition increases, and expectations are more demanding. A time when we need to make the best use of knowledge and look at each challenge from different points of view. A time for transdisciplinary integration of the sciences. A time when convergence innovation is needed most. Innovative leaders are curiously optimistic as they dare to take risks. And when leaders work together, the capacity to innovate increases exponentially. The world's most complex problems require convergence innovation. Through this approach, we have the ability to live longer, foster a better quality of life, and preserve this tiny rock we call Earth. It's why we are here, for the benefit of all. Thank you for everybody for joining us. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed and benefited from this very informative session, and I look forward to seeing you in future sessions uh, in which we're going to talk about uh, technology, careers, but most of all, making a difference, and, and you. So thank you for being uh, with us, and until next time, look forward to seeing you.